You're doing anything at all? Yes. Okay. No? Okay. Now I have to turn off the light and all that kind of stuff. And let's see. Nothing happened. I think when we talk about the Redwoods, we have to talk about the the original loggers up here, and there were several uh, different tribes that utilized the redwoods. When Jed Jedediah Smith came through in 1828, he was amazed at the giant trees that were here. At a horrible time, trying to come to many times, he would be from these bald hills up above us, and he tried to get down. These were grassy hills, tried to get down, and he had to go back and try to get 300 horses with him and mules, 23 men. Uh, but they notice that the Indians had actually had wooden houses. The tribes that we have here, they're in their ceremonial regalia, certainly a very civilized a group of people. Probably, if we had to compare them with Jedediah Smith and his bunch, and these fellows had the civilization, and Jedediah Smith was the savage. To the houses that, uh, uh, that you saw, starting out with, with the Hoopas up on the south fork of the Trinity River, and they had wooden houses, and uh, this is an old wooden house that kind of fell over. And uh, it was near Requa, which is a little town. It, you know, it, it sort of reminds me of how sometimes you give out false information. I had to work in a, in a uh, uh, visitor center, and we had a, a, some of the rangers, this one guy, man, you'd ask him a question, he knew the answer. And he said, somebody said, well, where does the word Requa come from? Oh, yeah, he said, it's an old French name, Requa. And uh, all of those uh, Indians moved into that old French town there. Well, Requa, which is down uh, the town that you see all sorts of uh, driftwood for sale down there. And uh, down near Oric is uh, actually an Indian name. And this was at Requa. But the uh, Trinidad Yurok, which live uh, farther south, rebuilt one of their towns at Patrick Point. Have any of you seen the town? Uh, re really nice, really super. And they do have ceremonies from the time uh, from down there from time to time. Uh, the uh, Kalawas and the Yurok who are up here built wonderful canoes. We took the junior rangers over and saw one of these canoes uh, today, but they either pole them or they paddle them. And they didn't actually go through the redwoods, but they spent most of their time actually uh, uh, along the seashore or along the shore of the river. Uh, there's not a lot of game way back in there. That's the county where I live. It's against the law to use the counterpoint. And, and uh, the folks down in L.A. probably the same thing down there because some of those terrible, terrible fires they had down there would get on these beautiful shaped roofs and it was just it, they couldn't control them. But, I, but obviously some people are buying shakes because they're, they're, they're selling them. But he's got an oxen and he's got a sledge and he's dragging it out over a skid road and the big logs down there at right angles to the red direction of motion, and keeps this the sledge from uh, moving in. And then sometimes we saw great big ones, like the dock seat and the big logs. We call that a skid road, and there's always some food there. And you've got a big a five gallon in a kerosene can with water in it, or sometimes rancid fish oil. And he uses it to, to lubricate uh, the skid road. The logs in the skid road probably made out of hemlock, which uh, are, are very common out here sort of a trash tree. Then it was. Now it's not. You can purchase that one under the name Hemi Fur. And if you've ever used the stuff, it's pretty easily and so forth. But, uh, uh, Douglas Fur back in 1930, these big trees here were considered trash trees too. And they couldn't sell them. And they had to sell them back east under the name of Oregon Pine. But anyway, there you see some redwood coming out and some uh, uh, and the a Big greaser. And there we go, back up in the pine country above Redding, above Sacramento. Uh, you could put these uh, ponderosa pine logs on wagons and solid tires and uh, solid wheels, and they had a, a metal rim kind of held together. Probably a Sunday because the ladies are out there and the fellows aren't working. The stompers uh, and the lumberjacks worked uh, 12 hour days uh, starting about uh, 6 a.m. after breakfast. Also in the, uh, in the pine country, with one end of the, of the log up off the ground, the big wheels like this, it's a lot easier to, to pull them. So the, uh, this was made by the Reading Iron Works, and, uh, and it was kind of interesting because when the, when the horses began pulling on it, the one end of the log 
they placed it up, and when they started to fold back when they went down a hill, uh, the log would be dropped to the ground would act as its own brake. If you didn't have that, when the horses started to go downhill, they'd start moving faster and faster and faster until your horse would caught up to the horse and get grease spots in the middle of the road. But uh, uh, if you ever go over to Reading for a class in the park, there's a little town called Big Wheels, and out in the uh, bushes there, uh, there are a set of no old wheels. Well, things have really kind of changed uh, when one of the uh, uh, timber barons down in Eureka uh, saw a ship in the harbor raise its uh, anchor with a little phoenix, or the donkey engine, because working on the donkey. They really put them down in the woods. And they have to use these big ox teams, the bull teams, you know. And so I uh, got one of them, and uh, this guy is the, uh, what you call a donkey engineer, who will first use rope, and then they use uh, tables. And if you go down to uh, a, milk, a milk crate, which is the uh, uh, next campground south of us here, he taped it all over the hillside because that area was logged back around 1820 or so. And he simply left the table behind. Sometimes they go a half a mile out into the woods. And this is the patent that gold here uh, saw on this, this donkey engine, uh, originally very small. And then they got really large. Sometimes they blew up. And when that happened, usually they wasn't generating enough power, and so the fellows would, uh, would running at the donkey engineer would, would put a belt or a wire around the safety valve. Get a little more energy out of that thing, but uh, he had lots of energy, and obviously the energy didn't go into turn the big weight. It just blew up. This guy here is the high climber. Somebody said, hey, why don't we put a big pulley on the top of the tree and then have the cable run a half a mile out to the forest and then throw that log in. It's not going to do a lot of damage to the forest. Uh, but you get it kind of all halfway off the ground. So they had this fellow made $100 a month. Very dangerous, very good safety line is. He's got a double bit of axe, he's got a saw hanging down, he's got a couple of wedges, and then he's got a, a nine or ten pound sledgehammer with him. And then he broke the top of the tree try and bring that thing down. Uh, one of the things you have to do first, you have to chop a, a groove all the way around the tree. So when the tree fell, the bark didn't strip down. Because the bark stripped down, they had the safety line on it, was freezing to death. And uh, sometimes they couldn't even do this, and they had to blast the top off with black powder. After they did this, they rigged it up with pulleys, and there's the donkey engine. Anything big in the woods is called a bull, and you let the bull donkey down there. And you see all the cables. Drag log chain, you get something like this. This is the log landing. And from the log landing, you can haul your logs out, but first by ox team, but later on by uh, things like little, little uh, locomotives. These are the fellows that attach the cable, and the cable had a big slick knot in it, and it choked off the log, and it's called choker setters. And choker setters still are used out in the woods, and they, they set the cables around them, and they kind of a uh, sharp at the end of the log, so it goes a little easier, and it's called Sink the Log. And uh, these fellows made about uh, $25, 30 a month. It was considered to be sort of an unskilled kind of a deal, but it was very dangerous. The log could roll, and one, one bizarre accident, they would have a, a, a rope from the donkey engine out into the woods where the choker setters were working, and a kid at the other end called the whistle pump. When they were ready, they would tell the whistle pump, okay, and he'd pull that rope, Whee! half a mile away, and then the thing would start coming in. Well, one with this accident, a limb fell on the, uh, on the rope. Whee! And the fellows were finished and started forward and killed six men. So it was a rough operation. Every day from about 1855 to maybe 1925, every other day, a man died in these woods. And uh, you, didn't, you didn't get real old. And if you uh, survived the accident, you might end up with a broken back broken shoulders and broken hips because these are great, big, heavy, heavy, There's a bull donkey there, about 1910, and look, they've taken an old truck and put flanges on it, and this is sort of a way of uh, pulling some of the uh, flat cars with the logs. You get them to move them around, they can move by their own bootstraps, and they can just be dragged along using their own power. Again, probably a Sunday, because it took time to take these old pictures and they made a little, little road for it. You could drag yourself along through the woods using uh, 
horsepower. Good power. I don't know how many horsepower. I would guess maybe 75 horsepower. That doesn't seem like very much. But they use pulley and cheese and, and uh, winches. And so that would be multiplied to any time. You know, rather than using skid rows, they just use an old sleeve bed and, and uh, uh, they call it a chute. And with the distance, you can see some and you're just pulling the logs along the chute. Well, that's an easier way. Why not? The rail, the wooden rails at first, with the little uh, deal with flanges on the wheel, fourth drawn, and then they brought other kind of steam engines, which we came in the Eureka on a ship, probably about 1875. And here in uh, then a little bit fancier, this one is called the Gypsy. Not only can it pull these big, big um, uh, flat guards, but it also can guard them. That is, it can, with that winch in front, it can load its own. Uh, own logs, which probably would be leading to a, uh, what they call a spar pole or a boom, and then they would get to load the logs right on, on these flat cars. These are the fellows that could, could move logs just using jack screws, uh, which is the old fashioned jack, and they, I don't know how they did it, but they could pile them up uh, in, in perhaps 40 feet high in yeah. what they call a log deck. And this was quite dangerous too. The logs would roll, and when they roll, and somebody was there, somebody would die. This particular engine is a special one called the Shea. Out here in the Redwoods, we have a lot of steep country. An ordinary locomotive, what they call a rod engine, uh, can maybe go up maybe two or three feet every hundred feet. That's a very steep drag. And the wheels would slip, and they would have a, they would have a little uh, uh, a sand thing, and, and the engineer could open the sand thing and give it traction. And I remember as a kid, uh, when we didn't have a lot of steam trains, and I'd, I'd be watching them. And when they would start out, the engineers up there opening and closing the throttle because he didn't want his wheels to start slipping. And when they start slipping, it'll have to go. Oh, 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 and lots of fun because they take rams of butter and put them over the rail. And uh, uh, when they were caught, uh, it was pretty serious kind of stuff. Here's another type of that Shea engine, which is let me well, I'm back up, but uh, what it, it had pistons vertically and went onto a crankshaft, like in your car. Went very slowly, but rather than maybe two or three feet in every hundred, it could go up ten feet in every hundred. So it can move up these very, very steep grades. It was developed back in Minnesota by a guy by the name of Ephraim Shea. So they call them Shea engines, but they had different kinds. This one that ran a crankshaft all of those called the Climax. Uh, old number four, you see them. And uh, in order to get traction with a rod engine, sometimes you get weight over those driving wheels. Uh, you can do a little bit better. And so the weight in this case is a big water tank right there, which we call the saddleback engine, or saddle tank engine. Uh, the funny looking uh, chimney is a, is a uh, spark arrester uh, because of the sparks would go zooming out, they'd burn wood, sparks everywhere, and uh, you could set the whole forest on fire. So when you see those, it means the chance of, of, of fire. And when you saw the old locomotives going across the prairie, they had them too, and again, to keep the prairie from burning. Happens to be a shea, right in the middle of a, of a train on, on a, I don't know why they put it in the middle, maybe it's, it's more traction or something, but pushing it across the track. There's a, there's a, uh, a trail down in Mill Creek Red, which is called the Trestle Loop Trail, and you can walk along it and you see where the old rail, railroad went from Crescent City uh, down to Mill Creek, about eight miles south of Crescent City. Uh, the railroads up in this area uh, all went to Crescent City, all went up to Brookings. This is the uh, they never went anyplace else. There was talk about connecting with some of the Oregon railroads up in the, the Coos Bay area, uh, but they never did get up there. But railroads were operating in this area until the mid-30s. And then the big log and stuff came in. So this is the kind of stuff that could grab what, what those loggers and the parking engineers could build. It's too bad we don't have very many of them left, but I guess they'd be off and would want to see that. It's an amazing thing. Well, another way to get them down is by means of a plume, a wooden ditch. And this is the Sanger plume. That's near Sanger, California, and Sanger, south of Fresno. And uh, they were actually milling and logging giant sequoias. They would cut them into boards and 
dropped them into this 50 mile long wooden ditch and it would go down to Tango where they'd be loaded on train. Uh, the first 15 miles, uh, the flume dropped about 3,000 feet, so from 5,000 feet down to almost sea level. And if you were sick, nobody wanted to get sick up there, they put you on a flume boat and lash you to it. And you would go that first 13 miles in a very short period of time. And it seems like most of them died of fraud. Even Disneyland doesn't have it. Once they got to the dock area, you had to work them on the schooner, sailing ships. Sometimes the work went to the dock where they built something like this. And they and or you may have a big bark and team which would come right into the city harbor. Or sometimes they would make a giant raft. And uh, these were taken down to uh, San Diego and actually uh, cut down in that area called the Banks and Ramp. It was a little uh, tempo floating down. They were lashed together with 700 tons of anchor chain. Well, here's the guys in the bunk house, uh, full of fleas, lice. Uh, they did have pretty good meals. They figured that uh, some of them count calories. We all do. These fellows took in about seven, 8,000 calories per day. A breakfast would be all the coffee to drink, all the milk to drink, all the canned peaches to eat, all of the, all of the flapjacks you could have, all of the sausages, all of the butt cake, and if you wanted to have steak, that was okay. You could do that too. Uh, for lunch, usually that was hauled up by the hallback line that would go back to the forest and sandwiches and stuff like that. Dinner was probably the same thing, but it would be lunch too. Cook was cool. a very important guy, and when a guy came to the camp, and these guys changed the pants all the time, they would look at the pigs. And if the pigs were fat, they wouldn't want to go there because they didn't want to let go. And if they didn't like the pigs, and wanted to get out with a bad cook, they would take a bunch of these flapjacks and nail them to the cook out of the door. And that cookie better get out of there fast. Redwood 
from 1945 to 1975 that had been cut in the previous hundred years or so. And here in Crescent City, you look like you were walking, you could get, you could get a job, anything, anything. Right there, eventually, you kind of run out of resources. And the town keeps wandering down, are notorious about going in the direction. Well, that's what we, uh, you know, these, these bills. And uh, do you know what this is? <coughs> Eureka. The car system is owned by a... You can go down there and see a lot of those really beautiful buildings. Uh, most of the redwood, the old redwood, burned up in the, in the fire of 1906 down in San Francisco. Have, we have redwood sidewalks, really super, super, super wood. But uh, this particular uh, building is owned by a private mix club now. I think it's called the Hinterwan Club. But they have Old Town in Eureka, and you can see a lot of these very, very interesting old Victorian buildings built on the redwood. Well, uh, you might end with a little commercial, but it's right We're fortunate we have five percent now. Uh, when it looked like the National Park was going to come in, there was a big campaign not to bring them in not to let them spend their money. And when they finally had to come in, uh, they had sort of an agreement with the legislature around here that the, the government had to spend, the federal government, $90 million. It also, uh, it also had to pension off the old water. And so because they wouldn't have anything, anything to do. So it was, it was some of the older fellows who it was a pretty good deal. But anyway, if they had been allowed to cut those records, they'd be gone now anyway. And now we have a nice, nice staff in the park. But John York, I always told him, I knew something had to be done, something to stop. And I told him, he's got the Central Virus Club, and Save the Redwood League, and the, the, those are the organizations that save most of these state parks. Um, they raise money, they match funds with the state government, and that they were able to buy these particular groves. For example, if you want to, get your name on a grove, and you get a bunch of people who will uh, go in with you, and you can donate. Uh, donate money to save the Redwood League, and that's where these names come from. You see along the side of the road. The little grove, somebody was asking about it yesterday, the little road, grove down to the uh, uh, Simpson Reed Road, just across here, it's called the uh, uh, California State Park Rangers Grove. And uh, rangers can go in there, and their band are usually not their dead, not always, but they can have a tree named after them for 300 bucks down there. Well, hey, that's great. Great. You, got, you got a name on the tree, and uh, they're able to buy more redwood. Uh, John Muir said this, and I always quote it. He said that God protected these trees from a fire, and from a flood, and from 10,000 storms. But only the American people could save you from the sawmill. I'm glad we saved some of them. And thank you very much, and that concludes the campfire. And I'll be up here for a while. And good night!